Recently, using Twitter, I have identified and found out the following blog post you see on the screen, and my idea is to analyze it now and actually go through the whole thing, explain what I do, so hope you guys too can learn, spread some awareness, and of course, pinpoint if I think something is not completely right and okay. So the blog post name is essentially making a PowerShell show called Downloader that evades Windows Defender. And the key point that actually made me interesting is that it is without AMZ bypass. So usually when you talk about PowerShell, you cannot really do anything without an AMZ. So AMZ is this interface that scans every single command you do, no matter if it's a malicious or not, and that's actually how it defines it. So essentially, AMZ.DLL is wallet into each process, and of course, with the PowerShell.exe process. And then when you do something, it's pivoted down to the AMZ DLL calling specific functions, and these functions determine if your thing that you try to run is actually malicious or not. So that, that's what MZ actually is, in a nutshell. So you run a PowerShell command, it scans each and every PowerShell command. Now, the key point here to, uh, here to mention is that AMZ do not work only for PowerShell, and you also have AMZ for .NET. So essentially, if you want to learn reflection and what's on assembly like certify or rubius then you're gonna most likely face the specific error message that's gonna prevent you from learning the assemblies if you didn't bypass the dotnet mz as well so there are powershell mz bypasses which work only for powershell and there are also mz bypasses which work only for dotnet and so combined so let's see what the guy is doing so I'm going to use the shell code runner I have used in the past, and this is the link to the code he's actually using for the shell code runner, and what this code actually does. So first thing is nice that it's obfuscated. So function names as well as specific uh, variable names are obfuscated, which boosts evasion, and that's something I can for 100% recommend to do if you want to get your malware go to any kind of AV or EDR. So if you want to be evasive, the obfuscation or doing variable names with something not common and not relevant is something which is basically the first step to do. So essentially we have several functions. We have function called potato and a function called apple and then some code is run down below. Now here this code is supposed to get all the assemblies for that current process, which in that case is the PowerShell. And then we're gonna get a module handle, okay. We're gonna invoke specific methods from one of, the, of these assemblies which are there, okay. And this method depends on the parameter we specify. So what this function does, here is the parameter, it gets all the assemblies and it executes the one we specify. Now about the Apple's functions, I'm not exactly sure what it does. So let us ask ChatGPT about it. So the Apple function in PowerShell dynamically creates a .NET delegate type at runtime. Delegates in .NET are similar to function pointers in language like C or C++. They are objects that can refer to methods with specific signatures. Okay. So I think that's how at the end we're going to execute stuff using the Apple function. And as ChatGPT says, it's going to create uh, delegate types from the given parameters. Okay. Now here, the parameter is the functions and the delegation type. Now it makes sense. Now after that happens, then what is done is we're going to get the buffer shell code into a variable called buff, which is not the most obsec safe thing to do. And then we're going to use Windows APIs for copying the buff to the memory. So I think the first one, the one here is going to actually allocate memory. And yes, I'm correct. So the first one is going to use virtual alloc to actually allocate memory. Then we're going to have a byte array with our shellcode. Then we're going to actually copy the byte array over the allocated memory from the row 18. And then we define a variable which is going to be equal. Maybe that's for just for obfuscation purposes. That's going to be equal to create thread and wait for a single object. So what you see here on the screen is a standard shell code runner 
that allocates memory with the current process, copies the memory for specific variable inside the, the memory itself, copies the value of the variable inside the memory, and then executes it by creating a new thread, and then wait for this thread to complete. Now, with this approach, I think there's a lot of things that can go wrong in terms of evasion, but I'm curious what happens next, so let's move on. Now, he's using that shell code runner. Then, of course, uh, Windows VM, the code is all, is all inside the PowerShell ICE. Then I'm going to add a URL variable containing the URL from where you're going to download the BIM file. And that's something I like so much. So for me, staging is one of the best evasion thing you can do. Why? Well, it's obvious. If your code snippet or malware do not contain anything malicious, then it's going to be extremely more times harder for the defense systems to actually see if it's a malware or not. Because imagine if you have your shell code inside the variable and that shell code is there and the AV or EDR can just analyze it and extract it and sandbox it and see what's going on. But imagine you don't have it there. You have it maybe on a file or in some form of a remote service like HTTP, SMB, even FTP or any other. So staging is something that I always do when it comes to evasion. And that's maybe my favorite technique because it works anywhere on any machine. It's important. That's maybe one of the most important steps. Now, in that case, we have a URL variable, which is going to be the URL from where we're going to download the binary file. And then we have, again, the buffer variable, which is going to be again by array, but instead of the raw shell code plain text, we're going to be, we're going to equal both variable to be web client download data URL. Now that's nice, but I have two considerations that are, that can make things better. And that the first one is to always use HTTPS. So when you download something, it's not going to be clear what you download at any point. And the second consideration is that to use specific variable names. Now, the guy did a nice job in the past to use obfuscated variable names like uh, cucumbers or parsnips, whatever that means. But for the buffer variable, which is by far the most not opsec safe thing or the most suspicious thing, it's just called buff, which is non malicious variable name. So if I was, if, if that was me, I would go for, for HTTPS because that enhances uh, the whole process and makes it harder to be detected and analyzed. And also the both variable should not be called a both variable, but something else. Yeah. Okay. Then we need to make uh, sure we allocate enough space for the shell code we're going to run. I'm going to move the cucumber variable to be below the both variable. He's first downloading the byte array, the shell code inside the variable. And the moment he does so, then he creates the allocated memory and he allocates just enough memory for the shell code to fit in. And it makes complete sense because here he is first using virtual alloc, which allocates memory, but he's not sure how much he needs because the main idea is to pass different shell codes, right? And after he puts the cucumber aka virtual alloc below and uses the size of the byte array, which is in that case buff, then he's gonna allocate the exact memory that he needs, which is better. Then, yeah, that's, that's where he just mentions and uh, modifies the length of the memory he's going to allocate. So that's what he's doing. Okay, then making sure we generate MSF Venom, raw type, and save it as a rev.bin. Ah, yeah, that's another thing I want to talk about. So essentially, it's a nice thing to test with shell codes like MSF Venom reverse shell. But on the other hand side, I think it's always Nice to test your malware with something more advanced and more heavy, like a Havoc to beacon, a sliver, uh, some mythics agent, or anything else. So you can try to generate a shell code from a open source CD framework, which is going to be more times bigger than the one from a reverse shell you see on the screen. And by doing so, you can see if your runner at first works. And second, if it's really evasive, 
because sometimes things can be different and I'm a huge fan of testing something that is practical. So if that was me, I would test it after I'm sure that it works with uh, the first shell, I'm going to test it with something bigger. But also one more thing, avoid using binary or that bin as a file extension. Why? Because that's suspicious. You know, you see bin, you know, it's a binary file. It's possible that, that it's, it's a shell code. I mean, I'm not sure how often systems are calling or using bin files, but I can bet it's not that often. So if it was me, I would go for something like a dot dot, dot ini, dot maybe txt, or even dot zip. It's dot zip, even though it's a shellcode inside, is more times better than dot bin. So that's one more thing that can also help you guys. Okay, then we do our simple HTTP server, which is gonna stage the whole thing. And then we're gonna also create the listener on port 4, 445, which is SMB. And this is the airport on which the server is going to connect. And now this is something which I enjoy so much and I like it. Because if you specify some port like 4444 or 8888 or something abstract like that, then on the network level, you are quite visible. The network defenders can see what's going on and they have rules for such connections. So trust me, they do. And if you use such ports like 445, 443, 80, 21, and so on, then you are less, the less chance to be detected because these ports are native. So always, if you can, use common ports like the one for RDP, the one for database, the one for SSH, FTP, or even SMB. If you can use such ports, do not go for something like 10,000, 20,000, and so on. Then after we run the script, we get a shell. Okay, but now the user claims that this won't evade defender. And yes, it won't evade defender because there's a lot of things which can go bad. One thing is the whole virtual walk, copy, create, create, wait for single object combination. And also the other thing is the unobfuscated raw shell code from MSF Venom, which is highly signatured and pretty much each AV solution knows about it. So I think these are the main two reasons why we're not gonna see progress, we're not gonna be able to run that with the Defender. Now, that's something which I enjoy about this blog post. Uh, it's using tools to see where exactly the detection happens. So in that case, I'm going to use Hamzy Trigger to see what lines of code may be detected as malicious. And that's something which deserves a video on its own. So guys, if you think that's gonna be useful on how you can use Hamzy Trigger, Hit me down in the comments, smash that like button. So I'm going to make a video about MZ Trigger in future. But essentially that's a tool which allows you to scan a specific script, of course. And then it tells you what exactly was flagged from the MZ itself. That allows us to bypass it in future. Now, in that case, even though it shows most of the code, the first line, it's what's triggering it most likely. So what the user claims is that in that case, the MZ trigger showed pretty much the full code, but he's sure that the first line is the exact match, the first match that MZ triggered. And that's most likely the reason MZ detects the and blocks this code here. So now he claims that even though it shows most of the code, the first line is, oh yeah, actually we, we read that. The assembly is called in the potatoes function. Okay. I'm going to put this part of the code in a separate file and use invoke obfuscation to obfuscate it. And yes, that's something we always have to do. And I would also do that not only for these potatoes functions, but for the whole code snippet. Now, what is invoke obfuscation? Again, this is a partial script which allows you to obfuscate more partial scripts. And if you want to make me a video about it, again, drop them in the comment and I can make a video about how to use Invoke Obfuscation. But it's part of my Patreon know-how. So if you're my Patreon, which I thank you so much for being my supporter, you should be able to have documentation in my Obsidian about how you can do that. Now, moving on, he just downloads Invoke Obfuscation. Then he decided to use Token Obfuscation and all possible obfuscations. 
So after that, we have a obfuscated code. In that case, it looks like that. So this here is exactly the same as this part here. So you can imagine how much different it is. Okay, then we replace that. So we replace the potato function with the obfuscated code. Then we save the file, enable real-time protection, move it to a folder that is not excluded in Defender, and run the PowerShell script, which in that case worked. Nice. I can say good job to that guy. I can say good job for making the effort to write the blog post, for making the research, and showcasing tools and technique. But what I think is wrong about that, it's wrong because, as mentioned, here he's using a reverse shell. Now, if you use a reverse shell, it works nice as a POC, but if you want to be more practical, then it's not going to happen. Because in real life, we, we tend to go for C2 frameworks. And it's not tested now for C2 frameworks, and we do not know what's going to happen. And not only that, but when you use C2 frameworks, you're going to need to make more stuff with it, like invoke assemblies invoke BOFs, do registry operations, and many more stuff, which are harder from the reverse shell and is not really practical from the shell itself. So my bet here is that, yes, he's not practically doing RG bypass, but in the moment he's going to need to do something effective or real-life scenario, then I'm just going to still kick in, because if you want to run execute, uh, execute assembly, for example, you're going to need to bypass the .NET MZ. So in my opinion, this can be a lot better. If the guy, maybe after the video, just good job, but I'm going to give some general recommendation. If after this video, you can maybe reapply the same steps, but not focus on the reverse shell, but on some real C2 frameworks like Mythic, like Havoc, like Silver, and so on. And then after you achieve your thing, then maybe try to do something like run custom PowerShell module, or run custom assembly, or run a BOFI file to see what's going on. And if that's okay, then I'm going to be super happy with the progress because you have something practical that works in real life. So as a general, as, as in general, I am happy with this blog post. I am happy with how the guys are thinking and how he calls stuff, especially the function names and variable names. Maybe this was the main idea of the blog post, but that's my recommendation always when you do stuff like that, when you go for evasion, always after you're sure that your shell works, always go for the bigger and stronger C2 frameworks, even Meterpreter. Give it a try. Thanks so much for watching this video. I appreciate you so much. If you think that is useful and you want to see more content like that in the future, drop the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and I'm going to see you into the next one. Bye.